Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. I'm a magician, and I'm pretty sure the kid on stage actually saw the lady in half. By Magpie Quill. A paranormal circus wasn't really my kind of thing, but I didn't have any performances that evening, and an anonymous benefactor had sent me a front row ticket. The sparkling black and purple circus tent was packed with people. I admit that I can be a bit skittish sometimes, and the macabre costumes of the undead clowns that would roam the aisles startled me an embarrassing number of times. But the show was a spectacle well worth the scares. The acts were at once chilling and captivating. I found myself holding my breath as the vampiric knife thrower stabbed silver blades dangerously close to her prey, and gasped with the rest of the audience when the ghoulish acrobats clung precariously to each other in their aerial act. Among the extravagantly dangerous performances, though, the showstopper was none other than the circus magician. Small and lean, and dressed in a purple satin suit, the magician didn't look any older than seventeen or eighteen. It wasn't uncommon for young prodigies to enter the performance scene early, but something about him was different. He exuded a kind of confidence that most wouldn't learn to have until well into their career, and wore a slightly crooked smile that made him at once charming and dangerous. As for his tricks, they were nothing short of breathtaking. With a wave of his hand, he turned the flowing purple drapes around the aerial silk dancer into fluttering rose petals and effortlessly caught the dancer in his arms. He called a volunteer to the stage, whispered something in his ear, and made him dance like a puppet on a string. At one point, he simply walked on stage and snapped his finger, instantly engulfing himself in deep violet flames that rose high into the air before slowly sputtering out as he took a small bow, completely unscathed. I rarely found much of a challenge in puzzling out the secrets of other magicians' routines since my own familiarity with magic usually made it easy to reason out how others would craft their own tricks. The silk turning into petals was a work of Clever step up and practice timing backstage. The volunteer who got hypnotized was most likely planted there, and while a full body burn was a bold move, these circus performers were probably used to risking their lives daily. I only began to suspect something was strange when the young magician began to perform a classic stage trick. A slender lady accompanied him on stage and lowered herself into a long wooden crate. Conventionally, the crate would be placed on a special designed table, but the table on stage was plain. The crate was also commonly wide enough to fold the body into, but this one was a tight fit. The feet sticking out of one side of the crate wouldn't usually move, but these bobbed as the lady adjusted herself. Mildly impressed, I was beginning to think of what clever trick the young magician had devised when the giant carpenter saw bit deep into the crate, and the lady began to scream. I gripped the edges of my seat and told myself it was just an act as the magician hacked into the crate. The screams grew louder and more frantic, and the crate rattled as the lady twisted in what appeared to be pain, her feet twitching Bastically, thick red blood began to pool underneath the crate. The magician didn't so much as blink. His blade, and now his hand, was stained, and blood dripped from the table as he relentlessly drew the saw back and forth, back and forth. The audience was silent, 
and the lady just kept screaming until there was an audible crunch. She went completely still. There was a lot of fake blood. I wondered if they had concealed a jug of it somewhere. They must have gotten assistance from some big-shot Hollywood artist to get the black bits of chunks in there. The magician put down his saw and turned the severed halves of the crate towards us to see. The audience gasped and murmured at the very realistic-looking torso halves. I peered into the crate itself. Other than the grotesque severed body, it seemed to be empty and plain. The magician swiveled the crate halves back together and smiled. His eyes glittered strangely as he took in the suspense. Then he placed his hands on the crate, closed his eyes, and simply breathed for several long moments. The lady's eyes snapped open. The audience cheered wildly as the magician opened the crate helped her to her feet, tidied her now blood-soaked dress, and led her off stage. As the lights dimmed and the stagehand swooped in to clean up the props, I could have sworn I caught the metallic scent of blood. Of all the people who could come up to me, I was intercepted by a demonic clown on my way out. He smiled wide with slit lips and jagged teeth, gesturing for me to follow. I don't really need any more pictures, I said. He kept gesturing. I let out a small sigh and followed him through the crowd to one of the side exits. We stepped out into the night, and he began to lead me around the back of the circus tent. Where are we going? I asked, beginning to grow uneasy. The clown just smiled back at me. I followed as far behind him as I could without seeming rude, which really wasn't very far at all. Before I knew it, we were removed from the crowds at the very back of the circus yard, littered with swampy puddles from the afternoon's rain. Square black tents, about the size of a typical New York bedroom's, occupied the grounds. The clown turned to me and pointed at one. You want me to go... Inside? He nodded. I swallowed. The clown stepped back in a comical, exaggerated manner, as if to pantomime to me he intended no harm. Somewhat encouraged by this, I stepped up to the tent and gingerly brushed the drapes aside. Sitting in the tent at the table, with two slender wine glasses, Surrounded by glittering yellow fairy lights strung along the walls, was the young magician. Upon seeing me, he smiled, got to his feet, and held out his hand. Mr. Herring, he said, a pleasure to finally meet you. In retrospect, it was incredibly rude of me not to shake his hand, but hearing him speak for the first time, combined with the fact he knew my name, caught me off guard. I blinked dumbfounded. You know me? Of course. From the Bellagio Escape Act, right? Ah! I felt myself blush a little. That was a long time ago. Certainly not long enough to forget. Please come in. I've always wanted to speak to you. Somewhat awkwardly, I took my seat at the table across from the young magician. The clown walked in carrying a tall bottle. I do hope you like champagne. I raised an eyebrow. Are you old enough to? The magician laughed. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, my apologies. No, no, it's really fine. As I sipped the rose-colored champagne, I couldn't help but study the young magician's face. Some of his stage makeup was still on, making his ankled jawline and high cheekbones stand out. He wore unsettlingly vivid purple contacts that were covered only by the tips of his long, thick lashes. He certainly didn't look old enough for any of this. Forgive me, 
he said quickly, noticing my staring. I don't believe I've introduced myself. My name is Alexander Chase. On stage they call me the Mirage. Hearing those words rang a bell at the back of my mind. I'd probably heard some of my colleagues talk about him. The Mirage, I echoed. That's in the name of the show, isn't it? The Mirage Carnival? Alexander smiled. Yes, this is my show. That's very impressive. Leading an entire circus troupe? Thank you very much. I couldn't have done it without you. Without me? You inspired me to begin performing. The Bellagio escape struck a deep chord, and since then I've followed all of your work. I've always wanted to be like you. This was completely unexpected. I could feel myself swell with pride. I dare say you may have already surpassed me, I said. The tricks today were very impressive. You don't know how much those words mean to me, Mr. Herring. Please, just call me Brian. Alexander smiled. Brian. The way his tongue formed the sound sent a quiet chill down my spine. In his voice, my own name became mysterious and dangerous. I was startled off my train of thought when a dozen heavy footsteps broke through the nighttime air, sprinting towards the tent. What is that? Alexander cursed. They found me. Who? Quiet. More footsteps scrambled to meet the disturbance. There were shouts of alarm and a loud resounding crack. I looked to Alexander. He narrowed his eyes at the drapes covering the entrance to the tent. The commotion drew closer with every second. A spray of gunfire tore through the grounds. Run, Alexander said. Don't let them see you. Before I could process what he said, he grabbed me by the wrist, turned to the back wall of the tent, and swept his other hand through the air. The black fabric wall rippled and peeled open like a flower blooming. What? He waved his hand and the fairy lights blinked out, plunging us into the night. As the last of the glow faded, I thought I saw him take something small and shiny from his pocket and toss it on the floor. Then he leaped through the hole in the wall, yanking me through behind him and began to run. A Alexander! I said quiet, he snapped in a hushed tone, and call me Alex. Voices shouted behind us, the heavy thudding of boots in pursuit. Another round of gunfire tore through the air. I almost dropped to my knees and scrambled for cover, but Alex kept me running. We ran out of the circus yard, through a break in the fence and into a muddy dirt roads. My joints cramped up and I almost slipped and fell several times, but my adrenaline kept me going. I risked one look behind us, but saw nothing in the dark. Police sirens wailed in the distance. Brian, Alexander said. Huh? We're going to jump. I strained to see the ground in front of us. Closing in fast was a puddle spanning the entire width of the road, filled with muddy rainwater. Wait, Alex! Jump! Something in his voice instantly compelled me to leap into the air, hurtling straight for the puddle. I yelped and held out my free hand, bracing myself for a face-first impact into each deep mud. Then we broke the surface and sank deep into the cold, murky water. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. I was somehow submerged from head to toe, tiny bubbles swirling around me like I'd just dove into a pool. I stretched my legs downward but couldn't feel the bottom. Alex squeezed my wrist. Buried in the sounds of rushing water, I could hear my crashing heartbeat. I held my breath, and long seconds passed until we heard the sound of boots splashing through shallow puddles directly above us. Then they were gone. Alex swam upward, pulling me along. We broke the surface and pulled ourselves into a strangely smooth and supple floor. As I caught my breath, soft yellow light flooded the small cubicle space. 
we were back in Alex's tent, surrounded by fairy lights. Alex's purple satin suit was dry, and so were my clothes. There was no trace of water on the floor. There was a click behind us. We turned to see the man in full body armor and a helmet with a reflective visor. He held a pistol pointed at Alex. Embroidered on his jacket was a patch that read NSF. Come peacefully, he said. Perhaps I was mistaken, but his voice sounded like he was shaking. His pistol wavered, trained between Alex's eyes. Alex chuckled. <laughs> You've got me. I really didn't want to put Brian and Herring in danger, but you just had to choose today to storm my town. The armored man's fingers trembled on the trigger. He began to reach for the radio at his hip. I swallowed. A Alex, now that you've seen Brian with me, I guess it's got to be either you or him. <laughs> Easy choice. Alex snapped his fingers. Deep violet flame sprang out of thin air and engulfed the man. I gasped and scrambled away as the man's armor caught fire like kindling. Wild gunshots rang out, but the bullets went wide as he twisted and screamed, the flames slowly consuming him. Alex stood still watching. A thin smile tugged at his lips. His eyes flickered with the flames barely concealing something deadly behind them. I cowered in the corner, only watching because I couldn't tear my eyes away. There was no heat to the flame, and instead of the stench of burning flesh, a sweet aroma of roses filled the air. The burning lump of a man crumbled to the floor. Slowly the screaming diminished to small choking sounds. And after what felt like an eternity, it was quiet. The flames flickered out. There was nothing left but a smudge of soot on the tent floor. Alex, I whispered, as the adrenaline sputtered, a million questions filled my head. The young magician let out a small, contented sigh. Alex, I managed, this time loud enough to be heard. I was trembling. You killed someone. It was you or him, Brian. How? They saw you with me, which put you in danger. I don't want you to live my life of being pursued. Not that you could survive long. But... He turned to me and put a finger to his lips. No more. Alex, I really need some answers. He stared me down with his unsettling gaze. I don't know what came over me, but I refused to falter. After a few tense moments, his eyes softened. One question, he said. I thought hard, but the million questions overlapped and echoed in an unbearably confusing chorus. In the end, I could really only ask one question. You're not human, are you? Alex smiled. He held out his hand and pulled me to my feet. I looked down at him, now waiting. No, he said simply. I nodded. It's time for you to go, he said. I would love to spend more time with you, really getting to talk, but not today. Will I see you again? One question. I pursed my lips. When you get home, no telling anyone and no calling the police. Got it? I nodded again. It was a true honor meeting you, Brian, something I'd looked forward to for years. Alex stood on the tips of his toes and leaned in close to my ear. Now, be on your way. I don't remember anything after that. When I came to, I was lying in bed in my house. I had a pounding headache, and I wasn't sure what day or time it was. It felt like I had been asleep for a long time. 
A quick look around the house revealed that the power cord on my Lineland phone was cut and the antenna on my internet router broken off. On my kitchen table was a sticky note with something written on it. Albeit shaky, I could recognize my own handwriting. One, no telling anyone. Two, no calling the police. See you again soon. I spent the next few days obsessively searching for answers. Alexander Chase. The Mirage, the paranormal circus magician, the boy who burnt a man alive with nothing more than a snap of his fingers and a ghost of a smile. I had seen so much but understood so little. I even began to doubt that what happened at the Mirage Carnival was ever real. The Internet offered little help. Alex had a Wikipedia page but the sections on his background and upbringing were blank. He had a sizable following all over the globe, but no one quite seemed to know anything about him beyond his performances. Theories and speculations floated about, but never any answers. One post on an online forum ranted about how the Mirage Carnival was secretly a cult dedicated to witchcraft and bloody sacrifice. Following the barely understandable ramblings was a poorly photoshopped picture of a glowing purple pentagram in the circus ring. I rolled my eyes. Despite my best efforts, the only real information I managed to glean about Alex was that he joined the performance scene about two years ago, in June of 2012 with a shorter circus performance accompanied by the same troupe. He had said that he had followed all of my work since the Bellagio Escape Act, which was in June of 2002, exactly ten years before the Mirage became known to the world. Five minutes remaining. Please use the Game Kit payment tool to add extra hours. I sighed. I had been in the Internet Café for almost two hours with nothing to show for it. The punk rock blasted from the speakers, and the kids across the desk wearing bulky headphones and yelling at their screens were staring at were starting to make me anxious. I used my last five minutes to check the ticket sales on my next couple of public shows, then logged out of the computer and got up to leave. The group of kids slammed their fist on the desk and screamed in victory, almost startling me into spilling my paper cup of tea all over the light-up keyboard. Two weeks passed, and I was beginning to believe that life was back to normal. I was performing at Lavish Corporate Party for Gateway Technology, a multi-billion dollar energy company alongside numerous other performers and musicians. The well-dressed men and women applauded as I took my handkerchief from my breast pocket, set it alight in a flash of flames, and turned it into a snow-white dove that flapped its wings on my fingertips. Outside the giant curved ceiling-to-floor windows behind me was a sunset over glittering streets. All of the venues they could have chosen the big shots at Gateway had decided to hold the party in a sky-high lounge on the Las Vegas Strip, overlooking the fountains of Bellagio. When seven o'clock drew near and the partygoers crowded by the window to watch the fountains start their nightly show, I was approached by a familiar face. An old friend of mine from my big stage days. Awesome performance, Brian, she said hefting her giant camera and snapping a photo of me as I put the dove back in its cage. You've still got it after all these years. <laughs> Thanks. Here to catch the celebrity gossip? You know it. Have you seen Scarlet Fantasia? She's supposed to be here for late evening shows. Award-winning close-up fantasy act. I laughed. 
I guess I'm not famous enough for an article anymore, huh? Oh, quit it. You know that's not what I mean. A tall, uniformed security guard came up to us. Excuse me, he said. Ma'am, are you on the guest list? Um, she's with me, I said. The guard furrowed his brow, scrunched up the bespeckled red birthmark running down his forehead. Please include all visitors in the guest log, Mr. Herring. My apologies. Please add Topaz Brooks to the log. She's a journalist for this event. The guard nodded grudgingly and walked off. Thanks, Herring. Really saved me there. You weren't invited? Sometimes I have to stick my nose in places. You think my job is all smooth sailing? Topaz was a photographer and journalist who specialized in snatching sensational articles on big celebrities and influencers. I met her first after my Bellagio escape act, when she pushed past the crowd to take pictures of me as I walked out of the fountains. I ended up remembering her because she dropped her camera into the water and almost got trampled by the crowds. I'm glad I'm here, she said as the lights in the room dimmed and the fountains far below lit up with 500-foot spouts of golden mist. Always a good venue. Reminds you of old times, does it? More like it reminds me not to be lazy with my camera strap. As the fountain rose and fell to the music I couldn't hear, I thought back to the shining metal cuffs around my wrists and ankles, the fresh confidence I had back then as they locked my cage and sank me into the water. My heart was pounding and my breath ran out quickly, but I was sure that a minute was all I needed. Just as I emerged from the water and stepped onto the acrylic platform they had built for me, the clock hit seven o'clock. Ennio Morricone's The Ecstasy of Gold played, and the fountains erupted all around me, lit up in a dazzling purple glow. I watched the spouts down below and imagined myself standing amongst them again. You know why they don't turn on the colored lights anymore? I asked Topaz. She frowned. What do you mean? The lights. They're just white now. Why don't they do purple like when I was performing or some other colors? The fountains only light up in white, Brian. They probably used one of those giant projectors to add color for your show. It was very exciting, but you don't get to see the projector come out very often. I nodded. Somewhere at the back of my mind, I must have connected the color purple to what happened two weeks prior, because I found myself asking questions again. Hey, Topaz? Yeah? Do you do any articles on Alexander Chase? The Mirage? she exclaimed immediately. Oh, I wish. I went to so many of his shows trying to net something. Anything. But he won't show himself to anyone who isn't performing. He's invited to everything, but shows up to nothing. Ah, I see. Why do you ask? Just curious. Topaz narrowed her eyes. Just curious, eh? What? You're never curious about other celebrities. There's got to be something more. I pretended to roll my eyes, but I really just needed to look away. Topaz loved to play detective, and she had a knack for it, too. It seemed to help out her career, and she actually managed to expose quite a few scandalous details about some powerful people. But in personal conversation, I didn't exactly want her to pry. The fountain show ended, and the lights in the lounge came back up. I went to his circus, I said, trying to cover for myself. He's pretty skilled, so I just wanted to know more about him. Topaz made an exaggerated, hmm. Then she laughed. All right, Herring, I won't pry. I know you don't like it. I began to say something, maybe to defend myself. But the partygoers on the other side of the room cheered, and Topaz perked up. Scarlet Fantasia, she said. She's here. 
She clutched her camera and bound off towards the lounge entrance, where a woman in sparkling red dress and high heels had just entered. Scarlet Fantasia, the close-up extraordinaire, broke into media a couple years ago and became an instant star, quickly working her way up to her recent Academy of Magical Arts Award. I remember her from an appearance on TV because she fittingly only wore red dresses, red hats, and red shoes, and because she had a particularly obnoxious laugh that sounded like a dying seagull. Her style seemed far too over the top for me, but I suppose I couldn't talk when she was the main attraction and I'd become a sideshow. I stayed by the windows and sipped on a glass of wine as the crowd cheered, and Fantasia began her performance. Don't you think she's amazing? Topaz gushed as she packed up her equipment and I gathered my props. I suppose her skills speak for themselves. No, no, the whole neuroscience thing. Researcher by day, performer by night. A master's degree and a conference award to match her AMA award, don't you know? I didn't. She's real talent, Brian. She still publishes papers with the NI and NSF once in a while. That's very impressive. What, are you jealous? No, not at all. We walked out of the exit of the lounge, passing by the tall guard with the birthmark. Thanks again, Topaz chirped. The guard nodded. Anyway, Fantasia's really one of those pet projects of mine, she continued. Can't go into details, of course, but I'm sure she's got something really juicy. At that moment, we brashed past another party guest, and Topaz turned away from me and began talking into the wall next to her. Stuff going on behind the scenes? Something in her research career? At first I thought she was simply looking at something on the wall, but she kept talking as if the wall had suddenly become Brian Herring. Topaz? She didn't stop talking. I tapped her shoulder. She didn't look. A chill went down my spine. I looked back the way we came. Standing at the end of the hall was the other guest we had walked past. He was small and lean, dressed in a purple dress shirt and black vest, with a deep violet rose pinned to his lapel. I stopped. Topaz kept walking and talking all the way down the hall to the elevator. The young man in purple smiled thinly. Alex? <laughs> Hello, Brian. Alex led me to a private meeting room with a coffee table. As I entered behind him, the door swung close, and I heard the click of a lock. What are you doing here? I asked as he sat down across from me. I was invited, just like you, he said. But you're invited to everything, and you show up to nothing. That's what Topaz said, Alex smiled. And it won't be showing up today, either. I came to see you, Brian. Me? This is where you inspired me, Alex said, twelve years ago, down by the fountains. His eyes sparkled in the way they had at the Mirage Carnival, when he had laid his hands on the severed crate and breathed in the silence tinged with the scent of blood. Nothing that he said was threatening in any way but I found myself eyeing the door. Alex traced the tip of his finger along his armrest, and the lights in the room flickered and dimmed. Every room in the building seemed to make the best of the view, and through the ceiling-to-floor window adorned with heavy maroon drapes, I could once again see the fountains at work. Alex stood up and walked to stand by the window, watching the lights fade in and out. After a moment of hesitation, I joined him. That day, at the top of the hour, everyone was holding their breath and waiting, he said quietly. All at once, the crowds upon crowds of people just waiting for you. I will always remember that. 
I nodded. In the silence, I could hear an echo of the music that accompanied the show, layered with distant sounds of the city far below. It was the ecstasy of gold. Did you do that? I asked. Alex smiled and put a finger to his lips. Listen. We watched in silence until the show ended and the white gold mist stilled the night. I was there, Alex said, among the people, lost and confused and alone. I'd never seen the fountains before, and I'd never seen such beautiful magic as I did that evening. I stole a sideway glance at Alex. His eyes were the same vivid purple, and in the city lights his smile was soft. I struggled to remember what he had looked like as he watched the armored man burn to death. I had a million questions. Alex. High heels clicked down the marble hallway outside. Several more pairs of footsteps followed. Alex tensed. Hide, he said. They're here. What? Alex pushed me back against the window. Then he produced something small and shiny from his pocket and stabbed it deep into my chest. I choked. The sensation was cold like steel. I scrambled Alex's hand off my chest and stared down at the spot where I'd felt the thing pierce my flesh. But there was nothing there. Not even a tear in my shirt. Alex, what? Silence! he hissed, and be still. He flicked his hand, and the velvet ribbons holding the drapes at either side of the window came undone. The heavy curtain fell into place, concealing me behind them just as the footsteps reached the door. I stood frozen, staring into the maroon velvet of the curtain that smelled like an old coat closet. Then I heard the door unlock and open. Alexander Chase, a vaguely familiar voice said, trailing the clicking of heels. The mirage. None other. Can I enter? You already have, Alex said. His tone was dark, a complete 180. I felt goosebumps spread down my arms. Indeed, the voice said. And you must know why I'm here. Because all you do is interrupt and intervene. Oh, please. It's time to stop playing your games. I'm here to take you back, Alex. The way she said his name, it was almost as if she would rather call him something else. You're welcome to try, Alex said. A tense silence hung in the air. Then the woman sighed. Security found the gateway CFO dead in the parking lot. Alex didn't say anything. Painted onto the pavement like he had a hundred-story fall. They found third-degree burns inside his empty eye sockets, Alex. Do you know what the humans call people like you? Magicians, he said quietly. No, the woman said. They call people like you murderers, serial killers, psychopaths. Are you aware of these words? Don't patronize me. I've lived here longer than you have. And yet, how will you ever belong when you've killed hundreds of people? My mind was reeling. I was covered in cold sweat. It took me all my willpower not to make a sound. Whoever was at the doorway, there was an entire army of people behind her, shuffling their heavy boots in the hall. You're a traitor, Alex said in a low voice. Leave before I make you. The woman in the room laughed. Her laughter was high-pitched and grating, like someone was slowly strangling a seagull. Scarlet Fantasia. Oh, Alex, Fantasia said. You know you could never shake me off your bloody trail. If you think you know pain, you've never once thought about what you've done to your victims. Something began to push on the drapes, slowly making me inch back towards the window. And you have never once thought about what they have done to you. Alex's voice was very close, like he was leaning back against me, 
to us. Look at you, mutilated just to look like one of them. Alex kept pressing into the drapes, pushing me backwards. It was a sacrifice, Fantasia said. I waited for my back to press against the glass of the window, but it never did. Alex laughed softly and leaned his weight onto me, pushing me out of the window onto the open air, the glass rippling as my body passed through it, like it was made of smoke. Sacrifice, I heard Alex say from the other side of the window, as I felt my feet tip over the ledge. The ever-present smile lingered in his voice. Then I was in free fall, into the glittering city far, far below. I wish I could say I thought of all the beautiful things in life in those seconds before I hit the ground, or that my life flashed before my eyes and I made peace with myself. But truthfully, my mind was completely blank as the lights of the Las Vegas Strip spiraled up at me at breakneck speed. Closer and closer and closer. The desert wind screaming past my ears, Alongside the distant sound of police sirens, I saw the pavement where I would land. Hard, unyielding asphalt. Perhaps I thought about death. Then a fraction of a second before the ground came up to meet me, staring at my toes and flashing up to the top of my head, I felt my body burst into thousands and thousands of pieces. Small, thin, fluttering pieces. The last thing I saw before my eyes dissolved, too, was a cloud of purple rose petals swirling into the air. I'm a magician, and nobody saw me survive a hundred-story fall. What was stranger than the sensation of shattering was the sensation of being put back together. Piece by piece, my conscience returned, and I slowly awakened into the warm desert night and the sound of rippling water. When my eyes came back, I found myself perched on a white stone ledge, my feet dangling over a familiar expanse of man-made lake. The fountains were quiet, having finished their nightly shows. The city that never sleeps, appeared to be asleep around us. The golden lights blinked silently. A Alex, I said hoarsely. The small boy, dressed in black and purple, looked at me and smiled. Try not to speak, he said. You could still be missing pieces inside. He opened his hand. Half a dozen purple rose petals drifted from his palm over his fingertips, riding a wind that I couldn't feel. I watched as the petals floated up to me and grafted themselves into the last missing threads of my jacket. The soft purple veins turned into smooth blue satin. I think I've found most of them, Alex said. The water under his feet rippled, and two more petals floated up to his palm. He placed them under my left eye, where they melded into skin. His sleeve was covered in red splatters. The memories from the evening came rushing back. A sickening feeling worked its way up from my stomach. I stared at Alex as he collected the last of the rose petals, the deep wet stains on his sleeves shifting as he moved. Alex, I said again, tell me what happened. He looked at me, and then, where I was looking, without a word, he leaned forward and reached down dipping his sleeve into the water. When he pulled it back out, it was clean. The water that dripped from it was dyed red, swirling into the fountain like ink. I waited for the color to thin to wavelets. It only spread until the water beneath our feet was a deep, dark crimson. I blinked. The whole fountain was filled with red. The night was silent. The police sirens were gone. I was sure that I had missed some final pleas, cries for help that went unanswered. I closed my eyes tightly and opened them again, 
The fountain was back to normal. I swallowed and forced my tongue to form words. One question. Alex smiled like we were sharing an old joke. One. Did you? I swallowed again. I felt like something cold was working its way up my throat. Alex, did you really kill hundreds of people? I wished desperately for his smile to waver, but it didn't. Yes, he said. His voice was quiet but crystal clear. Why? One question. Please. Alex let out a small sigh, smiling at me. Like I was just being stubborn. It's better that you don't know, he said. I need to. It's a dangerous thing knowing, he said. If you know things, you will act. If you act, they will see you. And if they see you, they will come after you. Who's they? The NSF? Is that the National Science Foundation? Why was Scarlet Fantasia looking for you? Alex didn't say anything. Did you kill her too? He shook his head. No, he said. She isn't so easy. What does that mean? It means you should be careful around her. She's one of my kind. If she finds out you know about me, she could kill you as easily as I could. But why? Why are people running from these people? Why am I not allowed to know about you? Alex chuckled. Humans are so curious, he mused. Always asking questions. Always wanting to know. I pursed my lips. You've been looking for me, haven't you? Do magic and mystery intrigue you? Of course. You've been looking for me, haven't you? Do magic and mystery intrigue you? Of course. That is so strange to me, Alex said. This insatiable need for chasing something you could never really understand. Do you not want to know more about the world around you? No, he said simply. For a long minute we sat there, looking at the water ripple beneath us. Then Alex spoke again. At least, at first I didn't. But the longer I live here, the more I think I understand. Humans say that knowledge is power. By knowing, we become powerful. A brown and white moth fluttered past and landed on Alex's shoulder. The young magician traced his fingertip along the stone, in shapes I couldn't discern. His eyes were shining dangerously. I shifted in my seat. Alex, I said carefully, human lives should never be yours to take. And why is that? He spoke so matter-of-factly that I faltered. Because, I stammered, because humans never seem to have a problem with taking lives. The trees and animals and the wind that sweeps through the desert, they all have lives that are shown no mercy. I bit my lip. Alex twisted his fingertip, and the moth on his shoulder crumpled into scales and wet skin scrabbling its legs as its life drained from its body. This world is full of ambition and hostility, he said in a low voice. That is how humans gain power. You're constantly killing and consuming and taking things apart limb from limb. I winced as the squirming remains of the moth rolled off his shoulder. It's time you stopped looking, Brian, Alex said. Return to your normal every day. I want to meet you so I could thank you for all you've done for me. I don't want to rope you into any more trouble. I sighed. You still owe me a lot of answers. I know. I'm sorry I couldn't give them to you. I nodded. For a while we were silent. Then Alex smiled. You're not going to stop, are you? 
No. He shook his head slightly, then pushed himself to his feet. I stood up after him. Are you leaving? Without a word, he held out his hand. After a moment of hesitation, I took it. His fingers were slender and cool to the touch. Then he pulled me sideways, tipping the both of us over the white stone ledge and into the fountain. As we broke the water surface, I felt gravity turn upside down, and the swirling white bubbles turned into the new sky. Alex's hand slipped out of my grip. By the time I found my footing in the chest-deep water and stood back up, he was gone. Sir, are you all right? Huh? I swiveled around in my chair to find the young game kit employee staring down at me. His eyes were tinged with a look of concern. I realized that the sky had darkened outside the window. Uh, yeah, yes, I said quickly. I mean, yes, I'm fine. Is it closing time already? Not for another twenty minutes. My computer chimed. A pop-up window that was familiar by now came up on the screen. Five minutes remaining. Please use the Game Kit payment tool to add extra hours. Do I get a refund for the hours I don't use? No, sir. We only charge by the hour. I nodded and closed the pop-up window. The Internet browser came back up, filled with search results for Scarlet Fantasia. I quickly closed the window and brought up the online payment tool. Sir? I cleared my throat. Yeah? You wouldn't happen to be Brian Herring, would you? I turned to him and gave him the best smile that I could. Yes, that's me. Oh, he exclaimed quietly. That's amazing. I love your shows growing up. Do you still perform? I've mostly moved on to private performances, but I still do stage shows once in a while. My next one is actually right here in Los Angeles. Ah, I see. The employee lingered by my seat as I verified my credit card information and paid for an extra hour. You look a lot different from when I saw you on TV, he said. I wondered if it was because I was older or because my hair was ruffled and I had bags under my eyes from lack of sleep. I reckon everyone looks a little different on screen, I said. Now, if you'll excuse me. Oh, of course. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Herring. <laughs> it's all right. The young employee scurried back to his desk. I pulled up my internet browser again and continued my search. Unlike Alex, Scarlet Fantasia had a readily available biography. Pasted all over the internet. Like Topaz had told me, she worked a double life as a neuroscience researcher and a star close-up magician. Half a dozen heavily technical reports published on the National Science Foundation website listed her as a participant from the Division of Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences. She had an email address listed under her name. I took a good hour thinking about whether to send her something about what happened in Vegas. In the end, I scrapped the idea. I wasn't sure if I was worried about the possible consequences or just afraid that Alex might find out. On my way home, frustrated by the lack of leads and perhaps a bit desperate for anyone who would talk to me about any part of this mystery, I pulled out my phone and called Topaz. She picked up after two rings. What's up, Herring? Topaz, I need some information. What information? Why do you sound so shaken up? I need to know about Scarlet Fantasia, I said, ignoring her second question. The juicy stuff you talked about. What is it? You want to know about Fantasia? Yes. Don't ask why. Why? Help me out here, Brooke. I don't know. It's just some stuff about her research. I don't have a lot of information myself. Not yet. I pursed my lips. Brian, are you okay? Do you know if Fantasia is involved in any secret projects? The line was silent. Topaz? How did you know that? Do you know what she's working on? 
So she is. Yes, at least I believe so. Now spill the beans. Do you have an insider's knowledge on Fantasia's research? I could really use some leads. I looked around. The neighboring streets were dark. I felt a chill go down my spine. If someone could be watching from just out of the corner of my eye. I don't know, I said, lowering my voice. I might. I'm not sure I can talk about it. Brian, just tell me what you know. No way. I'm the journalist here. When I publish my article, you'll read everything I put together. But for that, I first need help from insiders like you. I'm not an insider. This has nothing to do with magic or media. Just randomly stumbled across some hints. Quid pro quo, Herring. Tell me something, and maybe I'll tell you something. I swallowed. I could hear Topaz flipping through sheets of paper. I opened the gate to my backyard and the porch light came on as I unlocked my front door. I looked around again to make sure nobody was around before I entered. Don't tell anyone where you got this information, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Of course. I think Fantasia is going after something. Something like what? Something inhuman. What do you mean by inhuman? I don't know, I said. Something humanity has never seen. Something dangerous. Something we can't ever truly understand. Topaz fell silent. I gave her a good minute. It's your turn now, Brooke, I said. Tell me something. When she spoke again, her tone was serious. I've dug around a fair bit, pulled some strings. There's no way Fantasia has contributed in those reports they say she did. Because she and a group of the NSF are off working on a very unusual project. Unusual? Topaz sighed. I would hate to lose my underground sources. Do you hear me, Herring? I won't disclose any of this to anyone else. They call it the Swan Crossing Project, she said. It's mentioned in no media and no publications, but it's diverted 6% of all NSF efforts since 2000. As of last month, they've lost around 400 personnel conducting experiments. You know what it's about? No, I nodded. Thanks. If you know anything more about this, I'll call you back, I said. Promise. And if you have any sources you can share, hook me up. I will. And if you know what's good for you, don't go sticking your nose in government secrets. That's how you disappear off the face of the earth. <laughs> Look who's talking. Alex was consciously avoiding me, I was sure of it. I already knew that waiting for another fortuitous run-in was out of the question, so I had taken to scouring his show schedule to see when he would appear in public. To my dismay, I found that his shows, for at least the next month, aligned almost exactly to when I had my own gigs. Somehow, Alex had made it physically impossible for me to go out looking for him. At this rate, I'd never see him again. For whatever reason, despite everything that happened that scared me deeply, the thought of parting ways with the mirage seemed unacceptable. Maybe it was because I needed to know about the Swan Crossing Project and everything that made me at once fearful and curious. Or maybe it was simply because Alex had let me witness real magic after a lifetime dedicated to mere tricks. Before I knew it, I had canceled a private performance for some millionaire New Yorker and bought a plane ticket to Shanghai. And before I knew it, I was standing among crowds with my back to the riverside skyline, staring up at the sparkling black and purple circus tent of the Mirage Carnival.
I'm a magician, and I'm on the trail of real magic, by Magpie Quill. Seeing Alex perform again gave me chills I never anticipated. The crowd roared as he stepped on stage, wreathed in white smoke and flashing stage lights. The mirage was a mythical being. He spread his hands and the very air around us seemed to surge towards him, pulsing with heat and sound. My heart was pounding, surrounded by thousands of strangers, yet taking their breath away all at once. He was unstoppable. The circus yard under the night sky was packed with people. The costume performers went around taking pictures with whoever managed to snag their attention, sometimes making twisted faces or scaring squealing children back into their parents' arms. I looked around, pushing my way through the crowds. It took me a good while to spot the clown with the jagged teeth. After a few futile attempts at pulling him away from the chattering circus-goers, I finally managed to get him to look at me. His grotesque, made-up face went slack, ignoring the group of people who had massed again to take pictures. He steered me off to the side of the yard behind one of the popcorn carts. I'm looking for Alex, I said. He shook his head and then gestured towards the blinking gateway leading out of the yard. I need to talk to him. He shook his head again, flailing his arms at the exit. Why won't you let me meet him? He wiggled his gray spikes of fingers and drew little shapes with his hands, and then pointed at the gate again. I huffed in frustration. I don't understand. With ridiculously exaggerated strides, he began walking towards the gate. He waved his hand at me and then at himself. Just speak, I snapped. I didn't come all the way to China to get mimed away. The clown's shoulders slumped. He walked back to me, this time without the theatrics. His slit lips were pulled taunt. His throat above his frilled collar bobbed as he swallowed. Then he drew a half step closer to me and opened his mouth. Between his jagged plastic teeth, he had no tongue. I gasped. The clown closed his mouth again and pointed towards the exit. What? What happened to you? He shook his head. Slowly I looked around the circus yard at the other performers, jumping out at small children and posing for pictures. They only smiled with their teeth closed, and none of them ever spoke. What happened? I whispered. Did Alex do this to you? The clown didn't respond. His dark eyes glistened in the flickering lights. Please, I said. My voice came out soft, like I was talking to a wounded animal. I need to talk to him. The clown shook his head hard, then grabbed me by my shoulders and began to steer me towards the exit. I let him walk me out of the gates and leave me there, because I couldn't think of what I could possibly do to him. He glanced at me over his shoulder with a stern look as he walked back into the yard. I stared at the crowds of people, slowly trickling out of the exit of the Mirage Carnival and into the chilly night. I wasn't getting thrown out so easily. I rummaged through the pockets sewn into the lining of my jacket to find a handkerchief, some flash paper and a lighter, a silver confetti wand, and a couple of smoke pellets I used for my stage show. I took the lighter and the smoke pellets, took off my jacket, and hid it in some flowering bushes. Then, shivering in the cool night breeze, I went back into the circus yard. Hiding between the circus goers as best as I could, I snuck past the first few performers and ducked behind the popcorn cart. The clown with the jagged teeth was taking pictures with a family, paired up with one of the acrobats. He was gesticulating to her as if telling her something. Even as people crowded around him and pulled him into pictures, he kept looking around, making sure I was gone. 
I lit the smoke pellet and tossed them as close to the group as I dare. As the family walked away and another came up to replace it, I heard the crack of the smoldering pellet being crushed underfoot. A ten-foot-tall plume of white smoke spewed forth, clouding up the hanging lights. People shouted in alarm. I slipped past the crowds and skirted around the edge of the yard, then sprinted around the circus tent to the back. The square black tents were set up behind the big top just like before. I hastily looked around. From a small black tent tucked into the very back of the yard, a sliver of golden light seeped through a crack in the entrance. I went up to it and pulled aside the black drapes. Sitting there at a small round table surrounded by fairy lights, just like he had weeks ago when I first met him, was Alex. On the table were two small wine glasses and a bottle of champagne. Alex? He looked at me and smiled. Come in, he said. I've been waiting for you. I stepped into the tent and sat at the table across from him. You knew I was coming? Of course. If not today, it could have been any other day. Why did the clown not want me to see you? Alex didn't answer. He placed his hand on the bottle of champagne, and the cork came off with a pop. Tiny bubbles climbed up the rose-tinted liquid as he poured my glass and then his own. I swallowed. My tongue felt dry. What did you do to the performers? He glanced at me. Is that your one question? I pursed my lips. Alex put down the bottle and traced the tip of his index finger along the rim of his glass. Thank you for coming out here, he said quietly. You've come a long way. It means a lot to me. You know why I'm here, don't you? Alex nodded. He raised his glass. To mysteries and ambitions, he said, and everything in between. I picked up my glass and touched it to his with a soft clink. For a while we sipped our wine and listened to the muted shouting and laughing from the circus yard. Inside the tent, the air was warm. Finally, I gathered my courage and my thoughts. I opened my mouth and took in a short breath. Tell me about the Swan Crossing Project. Alex didn't say anything. At first, I thought he was simply ignoring me. But when I looked at him, I saw for the first time his ever-present smile had completely vanished. His unnaturally vivid purple eyes were trained on me. His gaze was steady and so keen, I could feel it digging into me like a cold needle. It took all of my willpower not to shrink away. Then he spoke in a low voice. You have far exceeded my expectations. I fidgeted in my seat. What does that mean? It means it's time. Time for what? He sat forward and held my gaze. For now, you need to leave, he said. Alex, you can't keep doing this. I know, but it's not safe to talk when the NSF knows where I might be. I'll meet you in two weeks in the Vegas Lounge, where Gateway had its party. There, I'll tell you everything. Everything? Yeah. He glanced around, against all odds the unbreakable confidence he had on stage was showing its cracks. He looked on edge, afraid even. His apprehension scared me. I can't talk now because Fantasia is here hunting me, he said. It's only a matter of time before she finds me, but I promise in two weeks everything. You promise? I echoed. You need to leave, Brian. If you're doing this just to shake me. Alex looked at me. My voice died in my throat along with what little doubt I had. The light in his eyes was shattered. Go on now, he said. Please don't let them see you. I stood up and pushed aside the flaps of his tent. Then I glanced back over my shoulders. Two weeks, 
I said. He held out his hand and pinched his fingers together, and I felt an electric current go down the back of my skull. Promise. I exited the tent and walked back into the cold outside world, the golden light fading behind me as the flap settled closed. There was still a sizable crowd around the circus yard. I warily walked around the bulk of the people, doing my best to avoid the eyes of the speechless performers, though I didn't know what difference that made now. A small, tinny hum lingered at the back of my head, like my ears were ringing. A new scent pervaded the air. It smelled like roses. It looked like my vision was tinged with purple, but I couldn't be sure in the flickering colored lights. Among the chatters in a language I didn't understand, one voice came through. I looked in its direction and saw the tall guard from the Vegas Sky High Lounge with the speckled red birthmark on his forehead. He was wearing the same uniform and the same gear, and holding his hand with a mouthful of cotton candy was a boy in a cartoon-printed hoodie. At the same time as I spotted the guard, he looked my way, his eyes lit up in recognition. Mr. Herring, he said, I didn't expect to. His voice faltered mid-sentence and his eyes widened. I inadvertently took half a step back as he started making choking noises deep in his throat. His whole body convulsed, shivering violently. He wrenched his hand out of the boy's grip, drew the pistol from his hip, cocked it, raised it up to his temple, and pulled the trigger. Warm blood turned to mist in the hanging lights. The ringing in my ears vanished as the murmurs of the crowd turned to screams. The scent of blood replaced the roses. The guard crumpled to the ground. The boy with the cotton candy stared down at him, wide-eyed and pale. My trembling legs seemed to move on their own, and before I could say anything, I had slipped through the scrambling crowds and out the exit. I'm a magician, and I finally got the mirage to reveal his secrets. By Magpie Quill Law enforcement refuses to believe the death of the Vegas guard was anything but murder. Three days later, a gangly local teen was arrested as the prime suspect. The guard's name was Evan Pere, and he had been flown out to Shanghai for a principal shareholder for Gateway Technologies. He had brought his nephew, Joel, with him. The young boy's horrified expression haunted me. They're not letting the kids speak, Topaz said on the phone. I don't believe the suspect really is guilty. I'm sure of it. This is foul play of some other kind. On my way to and fro the Game Kit Internet Cafe, with a small local flower shop, the storefront was decorated with bouquets of roses. The scent of the deep red blossoms was sickening. Two weeks crept by and I found myself at the gilded wooden double doors leading into the Vegas Sky High Lounge. At first I thought the doors were closed, but I tugged on the handle, and they inched open with a heavy creak. The lounge was dark and quiet. The only light was from the glittering nighttime skyline, beyond the curved ceiling to floor windows. As I entered, the clock struck seven, and the fountains of the Bellagio began their show. The spouts that shot up were deep, deep purple. A small silhouette sat at a round table by the windows. I closed the doors behind me and walked up to it. The faint city sounds drew closer, along with the echoes of ecstasy of gold. Set on the table were two glasses of champagne. I took my seat. 
Alex gazed out at the fountains. He was wearing the same outfit he had worn the night after the gateway party. As the purple lights rose and fell, rusty stains seemed to flicker on his sleeve. You promised, I said. Alex hushed me. I crossed my arms and he smiled. Just watch. We watched the fountains in silence again. Only when the lights went dark and the mist settled did Alex turn to me. I owe you a lot, he said. You keep saying that. What have I done for you? Everything. He spread his arms. All of this. None of it could have happened without you. Twelve years ago, on that beautiful night, when you inspired me to become something greater. The city lights flickered. Bloodstains appeared on his sleeve again before fading. Tell me what you are, I said. I'm an escape artist, just like you. What did you escape from? The Swan Crossing Project. I looked at him expectantly as I sipped from my glass. The champagne had a slightly flowery fragrance. I was glad it wasn't roses. Alex looked away and out of the window. Fridays before eight, the fountains come on every thirty minutes, yes? Tell me about the Swan Crossing Project. Alex sighed lightly. Then he looked back to me. How much are you willing to risk, Brian? What does that mean? It means what I could tell you will change the way you see the world forever. Are you willing to accept that? I pursed my lips. Alex waited. You've already changed the world, I said finally. I've seen feats of real magic. Will the things you tell me change it even more? Maybe. How? Would you like me to tell you? The way he stared at me made me shrink. His expression was serious. Yes, I said. Tell me. Alex smiled thinly. I think it's your curiosity that makes me the most curious. Isn't that strange? Perhaps. Now it's time you answer my questions. Alex nodded. To make a long story short, there are other worlds besides this one. Other worlds? Yes. Entire other realities. From what I can tell, these worlds have intersected for brief periods of time throughout history. But the humans who live in this world were the ones with the curiosity to investigate. Other realities? Like alternate universes? I don't know. That's a human term, and I haven't had much reason to look into the countless theories and speculations your kind has come up with for these intersections. The point is that other worlds exist, and I'm from one of them. Which one? Alex smiled. He traced his finger along the rim of the table, and the world around us began to shift. A thick, Sweet scent filled the air. Soft trilling sounds fitted at the edge of my auditory perception. The carpeted floor and glass walls fell away, and a bed of leafy, soft-glowing fuzz took their place. The city skyline melted into winding thickets and towering spires of sparkling black rock. The night sky brightened into twilight, where sheer white insects, far too large to be dragonflies, fluttered about. If I had to describe it, I would say it looked like a twisted, glowing forest that stretched up and down in infinite canopies. But human words couldn't come close to emulating what I saw and felt. Things chattered from under our feet, like they were talking. The swirling wind whispered, it smelled like musty earth and acid, and then like honey and rain. This is your home, I murmured. This is my home as I remember it, Alex said. It's just an illusion. I haven't been home in... 
a long time. There was a tremor in his voice. I looked at him in surprise. Alex turned his head to the ground and swiped his hand through the air, tearing the glowing world down by its seams. Everything blurred into static, and a cacophony of indistinct sounds filled my head. By the time it had quieted to silence again, we were back at our table by the lounge windows. The concrete and glass skyline blinked in the night. Alex didn't look up. What happened? I asked gently. They took me. Who? The humans from this world took me, he said, in what would correspond to your February of 2000. They finally broke through to these other worlds and opened a gate. They came in suited and masked, shouted in strange tongues and carrying weapons I'd never seen. Many of them died, but more kept pouring in. They bound me up in nets that burned, and then they took me. And then you escaped? No. First they threw me in a prison with others who had been taken just like me, from many different places that I'd never known of. The stuff between worlds was riddled with holes. Humans wanted to turn it inside out and pick everything clean. They already had names for us. They'd been waiting and hungering for centuries to keep us in cages like animals in your zoo and study us. Centuries? Alex nodded. I sat there and thought in silence for a long time. What Alex was telling me sounded much too fantastical. But then again, so was everything that I had seen happen since I met him. They called our prison Swan Crossing, he said. Tell me about it. What do you want to know? It was strange being asked that question. Where is it? It's another reality, Alex said. A smaller place. Something the researchers have taken to call a pocket dimension. How did you escape and get here? They took me through their gate. Why? Because they wanted to cut me open and put me in a jar. He spoke bluntly. I bit my tongue. Swan Crossing is like a cage. There were others like me that they kept, and then they took out. I saw what happened to them. They're taken apart piece by piece and strung together in giant glass tubes with their dead eyes still open. The sweet champagne bubbled in my stomach. I did my best to keep my breathing steady. They took me out and away from the others and strapped me to a table covered in plastic. Then they started to cut me with a knife. He looked at me and his eyes were wild. It burned like hell. Pressure in the room ratcheted up making my ears pop. A low hum began to resonate from the floor up my bones. A tremor passed through the foundations of the building. Dust rained from the ceiling. Giant cracks raced down the curved glass windows. Uh, Alex? He exhaled, and his breath came out in a plume of sparkling smoke. He squeezed his eyes shut and his knuckles turned pale as he gripped the edge of the table, slowly twisting in pain. I watched horrified as his skin began to smolder like deep purple embers, crisscrossing patches of skin peeled open all over his face and hands, curling outward as their edges turned to brittle black soot. The thick, dark ooze underneath bubbled and steamed. The air grew heavy with the scent of roses. Alex shuddered, dripping blood onto the table. Slowly, shakily, he raised his hand and stared down at the deep fissures peeling back his skin. Then he closed his eyes tightly, and everything went still. The humming stopped. The cracks retreated from the window. The wounds closed like flowers after dark. 
and the burns faded away. He opened his eyes and looked at me as if nothing had happened. That was how I began to discover my power, he said. I remember the pain. I remember the screaming. And then, and then, everyone was gone. Ashes. I picked up my pieces and then I ran. I swallowed hard. Sorry, he said quietly. I've been training for ten years and this still gets to me. That's okay, I managed. After all you've been through. He cracked a tenuous smile. You're very brave, Brian. Have I told you that? Despite everything, I felt some of the blood come back to my face. I'm flattered. No, really. I greatly admire your courage and confidence. Your conviction in everything you do. Your tenacity. Those are such dangerous qualities. But you use them well. And your kindness. His smile wavered. He glanced out the window. Our time is almost up, he said. What? I'm sorry, Brian. I... He cast his eyes down to the floor. I lied to you. What do you mean? I thought... My words were cut short by an explosion of pain, searing white agony, like someone was itching the blade of an axe into the back of my head. I clutched my head between my hands. Deep down my throat, something was beginning to boil. I'm sorry, Alex said, his voice shaking. Please, someday forgive me. My stomach cramped up, and I began retching. Bitter fire clawed its way up my throat and seeped through the inside of my skull. I choked out a strangled cry. Outside, the fountains of the Bellagio came back on. A flare of white gold light filled the lounge and eliminated the two glasses on the table. One was filled with the familiar rose-colored champagne. The other, on my side of the table, was tinted blue. I tried to find words, but my tongue turned stiff. All sounds turned tinny and distorted. My vision blurred. I felt my body hit the floor. Hands came around my shoulders and pulled me upright. I was inched away from bright purple eyes. My vision jerked into sharp focus for a split second, and I saw they were shining with tears. Look at me, Alex said, his words echoing in my ears. Everything about me, all your memories with me and of me, call them to mind one by one. I coughed out shallow breaths. I didn't know what he was doing. I'm sorry. I couldn't tell if it was the same person talking. I couldn't discern where the voice was coming from. Not anymore. I'm sorry I turned this despicable invention against you. I stole it when I escaped, thinking I could use it as a weapon, but I promise that I only want to keep you safe. A strange numbness was coming over me. I could feel parts of my brain turn blank. When my vision flickered into focus again, I couldn't recognize the face before me. Brian! The stranger in purple smiled, tears streaming down his cheeks. I wanted so badly to ask who he was, but my voice didn't work and everything was numb. The young man gently propped me up against the warm glass windows. Then he removed the deep purple rose from his lapel and pinned it onto my jacket. Here, he said, it's something for you, something to be curious about later. I felt his words fade from my memory as he spoke. Be safe out there, okay? I had a million questions, but the young man stood up slowly giving me one last look, and turned and walked away. I heard doors open. By the time they closed, I couldn't remember who had been there. Everything was cold and numb. When I began to feel things again, soft morning light was streaming in through windows. 
On the round table by the window were two empty wine glasses, like I'd been drinking with someone. Perhaps I'd gone a bit overboard, though I rarely took part in more than a glass or two, much less drink enough to black out. I managed to pull myself to my feet. I stood by what would have been my chair and pondered for a long time about who could have been sitting across from me. A small corner of my heart was aching, but I couldn't remember what for. I was about to leave when I noticed two things. One was the purple rose pinned to my jacket. The other was a piece of paper on the floor by the chair across from me. I walked over and picked it up. It was a small, white strip, laminated to be waterproof. The side facing up had dry blue stains. I flipped it over. Printed on the other side were three lines of text. SF Lab Internal. Handle with care. Prototype formula number 1106. Activation window, 30 minutes. Swan Crossing. I felt an electric current go down my spine. My thoughts were hazy, but those last two words were clear as day. I'd heard them exactly once before. I pulled out my phone and began to dial. End of Arc 1 The Mirage Carnival Postscript At this point, it's probably apparent that all of this was recorded after the fact. I first met Alex in 2014, and by now it feels like an eternity has passed since then. Alex. The name feels strange on my tongue. It feels strange to call him that now. For all the promises we made and broke, this wasn't the last time that we would see each other. Far from it. And the only reason I can write about this now is that, after everything that has happened, it doesn't matter anymore that I keep these stories secret. If you'd be so inclined, stay around for the journey that turned my world, just as Alex promised. If not, I thank you for your time and wish you the best of luck in all your endeavors. So quoth this race. Thank you for listening, my dears. I so appreciate you coming to listen to my little stories. I hope you all have a lovely Tuesday out there. And special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Ermin, Darren and Jennifer, Laura, and Charlotte Emerson. If you like this, please hit the little button to let me know. If you didn't, hit the little button to let me know. Leave a comment. I'm always glad to talk with you, my darlings. I'm open to suggestions and criticisms, critiques. If you have not subscribed, please do so and ring the little bell so you know when to come up and see me. And I will talk to you next time, my darlings. <laughs> Farewell.